Good evening, everyone. Welcome on this hottest evening of the summer. Um, we're very pleased to be in this gorgeous new space. It's the first time we've ever used it for an event. And um, we're just very happy that you still can't hear. Can you turn it up? Okay, is that any better? Okay, great. Um, I am Liza Bernard from the Norwich Bookstore, and Karen and Megan are here helping me tonight if you've got questions. And the format is going to be pretty simple, a brief introduction of our author, and then she will speak and read and question and answer. And then um, we will break, and she will come to the front and sign books that are purchased. The books, as you all saw as you came in, are out there. Um, and I want to mention that uh, the Norwich Bookstore has a very busy fall lined up. We've got poetry readings, we've got fiction, we've got nonfiction, and we've got events for kids. And I encourage you to um, visit our website and um, sign up for our e-newsletter, which we send out once a week. So, as you might imagine, I have read a lot of books in my 20 plus years at the Norwich Bookstore. Some of them are entertaining, some of them are educational, some enlighten, some calm, and some rile me up. But very few do all of the above, like Terry Tempest Williams' The Hour of the Land. This book is truly an amazing piece of writing. That Terry grew up in Utah has informed much of her writing on the environment as well as on women's social and health issues. She and her husband, Brooke, currently divide their time between Utah and Wyoming. She has taught all over the place in various capacities, especially at the University of Utah um, for many years, and we're lucky to have, have had her often in the Upper Valley teaching at Dartmouth. Uh, Terry has been granted numerous honorary degrees and has been appropriately recognized with awards ranging from the Wallace Stegner Award um, by the Center for American West, the Robert Marshall Award from the Wilderness Society, which is its highest honor given to a private citizen, the uh, Community of Christ International Peace Award, the Sierra Club's John Muir Award. She's published 18 books, and perhaps coming to the national spotlight, or at least to my spotlight, with Refuge, an unnatural history of family in place. But we, um, her fans at the Norwich Bookstore, first met her in 1996 when she spoke at Dartmouth about um, the book An Unspoken Hunger. She continues to write and speak about environment in the most personal and the most universal terms. So I could spend the whole evening just listing the books and articles and awards, but I think it's more important that we hear from her about her book. Please help me welcome Terry Tempest Williams. Good evening. Can you hear me with, with this? Uh, thank you, Liza. I have such deep, deep respect for you. And uh, what you need to know is that Liza and Penny really um, stood behind this book, The Hour of Land, really early at the point for a writer where you think, oh my god, what have I done and where can I hide? And I just want to thank you so much for, for your support. And I appreciate uh, the Norwich Bookshop. Um, we all know what it means to our community. And I appreciate Karen and Megan and Sarah, those of you who work at this incredible bookstore. Um, early on, I worked at a bookstore for 10 years. And it really was so important in my own education of realizing what books mean to us. Um, in our interior landscape. It's hot. <laughs> and I am so thrilled to be back to what I would call home. Um, I have never been to the Upper Valley in summer. In fact, you know, mainly we've been in the winter and spring. I love spring because you have all four seasons at once. And then we usually get that one last week where it's warm and the leaves come out. But what a glory. And to see that beautiful, uh, women's club garden. I just, we don't have gardens like this in the West, so it's really beautiful. And everyone looks different. 
in summer clothes, you know. <laughs> so I feel like I'm seeing the underside of of this community. Um, I want to pay particular uh, respect and gratitude to Andy Friedland. He has been traveling with me um, from New England, from Maine down. And it's just, Brooke had to return home. He's um, so sorry he's not here. He's doing some ground truthing in the desert lands, the leased lands that we purchased um, in February. And uh, this is between us, uh, but the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, has not given us our leases yet. It will be uh, six months on the 16th. So Brooke wanted to go and see where the other um, leases are surrounding ours and wanted to see where the, um, the actual rigs are and where the storage tanks are. So that's where he is before the 16th because we are going to call uh, for a decision. So Andy has been absolutely stellar and we've had so much fun and Katie I'm so grateful where are you for sharing and um, it's just this whole valley is filled with friends and you know who you are and I'm deeply grateful um, for the histories that we share I also I'm really grateful to Christina Seeley I don't see her here but she is part of this book um, as a photographer, her image is in the chapter on uh, Glacier National Park. And I want to say, tonight I want to do something different. I rarely talk about process. Um, but because we're among friends, I, I want to spend a bit of time talking about how this book came to be. And then I'm going to read two pieces, um, open it up for questions, and then close with a story and we'll, we'll just absorb the heat as though we're in the desert, you know? <laughs> in New England in summer. I wanted to write a book where I wasn't hiding. And that may surprise some of you because some people have said that, you know, there's a level of honesty or, um, transparency to my work, but there actually isn't. And what I mean by that is I have hidden behind metaphor. And whether it was a rising Great Salt Lake and the death of my mother, whether it was mosaic, um, finding beauty in a broken world, uh, looking at, at mosaic as a metaphor, even uh, the empty journals of my mother, they were all structures where I could disappear. And if I'm being honest with you, um, I think it was because I was so passionate about the land and I didn't know, I didn't dare be bald with that love. This book, um, there's no place to hide. And I wanted to write a book that really spoke about our public lands, um, particularly our national parks, especially at our centennial, where we are in conversation about these lands, what I would call America's commons. And particularly in the American West, uh, where Brooke and I live, um, they are absolutely under siege with our governor, uh, Rob Bishop, who's infiltrated New England in Maine um, as our congressperson. Uh, they want to take the public out of public lands, and that should scare all of us. And if you look at the GOP platform, and I'm not usually this blatantly partisan, but you will see as one of their major tenants, quote, to dispose of all federal lands unquote. And that should absolutely distress all of us. That means our national forests. That means Bureau of Land Management lands. That means wild and scenic rivers. That means national seashores, national parks, state, you know, um, and monuments, refuges. And we saw a taste of that with the Bundy separatists, as you know, 
in January in Oregon at Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. That is what we are facing. And I wanted to write a book that really looked in a deep way about what these public lands mean to us. What I know is that Westerners absolutely understand what these public lands are, because in the state like Utah, 70% of our state is owned by the federal government. In a state like Nevada, 90%. So in that way, you can see why people are afraid, because the land, the, pub, the private land is, is very small, and therefore the prices can go up very high. And that's where a lot of this tension builds. Um, Here's an example. When I was in New York with a friend, we were honoring a conservationist. I was with a friend who's a neighbor in Castle Valley, Utah, Bill Hedden, who runs the Grand Canyon Trust, really, really smart. And he said to me, you know, it's so depressing because look at all these people on Madison Avenue. We were coming out of the Whitney Museum. He said, nobody knows what public lands are. And for sure, nobody knows what BLM lands are, Bureau of Land Management lands, which are the largest landholders in the American West. It's grazing lands, the lands that nobody wanted. And I said, he said, only uh, one out of 10 people know that. Have I shared this story with you? And um, I said, you're such a pessimist. You know, I, I'm sure that more than, I'm sure that at least one person, because he said, I bet nobody knows. And I said, I bet there has to be one person. And he said, okay, I'll bet you $100. <laughs> and I said, you're on. And he goes, go. So I walked up to the first person, and it's interesting how times change. Today, if someone were asked what is BLM, it might be Black Lives Matter. But then, this was a few years ago, not so much. So I walked up to the first gentleman and I said, excuse me, could you tell me what the BLM is? And he said, a car? And I said, okay. Um, went to another person, could you tell me what a BL the BLM is? And they said, an airline, um, a disease. Uh, it went all through the gamut. Um, we were to nine people. And he said, all right, I, I'll take the hundred dollars. And I said, no, no, I have one more. And I scanned Madison <laughs> Avenue very carefully. And across the street, I kid you not, there was a young woman wearing turquoise. And I thought, she will know. So I leaped across all of the cabs, you know, almost died. And I literally attacked her, which was not a good thing. I grabbed her and I said, excuse me, can you tell me what the BLM is? And she goes, you mean the Bureau of Land Management? I threw my arms around her, kissed her, and she said, I work for them. Am I in trouble? <laughs> And I think that last, sec you know, her last comment, am I in trouble? It shows you the paranoia. Um, because our federal land workers, be it in the Park Service, the BLM, the Forest Service, they're really under siege from all sides. And I really want to acknowledge, is there anyone here that has worked for the Park Service? Would you stand? I just really, we want to honor you. Thank you. So I wanted to really honor these pub public lands in a way that could be heard and understood. And the best way, the most familiar um, parcels of our public lands are the national parks. And what I've come to understand is that no matter where we are in the political spectrum, left, right, center, um, if you start talking about national parks, the blood pressure goes down, um, there's an embrace of mind and heart, and they become memory palaces, places of family, places of generational stances, places where, where people scatter their ashes. And so that's what I wanted to do. I chose 12 of these national parks. There are 60 national parks. There are 410, it, it's varying because President Obama has been wonderful in establishing more national monuments and parks. But out of the 60, 400 plus, um, I chose 12. How did I choose those 12? I can tell you that I thought about it as a dinner party. 
And I thought, okay, who do I want at the head of the table that can be the anchors? And for me, it was my mother park first, which is Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Um, and then at the other head of the table, it would be Canyonlands National Park where Brooke and I live in Utah. And then you think, okay, now in the center, who's gonna carry the conversation? Who do I know, but do I want to know better? And for me, that was Acadia National Park in Maine and Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, where Theodore Roosevelt said it was in the North Dakota Badlands that after the death of his wife and mother on the same day, when he fled public life, he went into the heart of the Nakota Badlands, this part, and he said this was where he was allowed to grieve with the melancholy doves, mourning doves, and develop the character where he could later become president. Other guests. I wanted to invite the guests that scared me. Um, I didn't know them, but I knew other people who did, and I thought they would invite them. And that would be Gettysburg, that would be Alcatraz in California, and that would be the Gulf Islands National Seashore, where the BP oil spill was. War, imprisonment, and devastation. There were those that someone said, may I bring? as often is the case. Effigy mounds in Iowa on the border of the Mississippi River across from Wisconsin. I had never heard of effigy mounds. How many of you have heard of effigy mounds? How many of you have been there? It's such a secret and I would tell you, Brooke and I both felt that Effigy Mounds National Monument would literally be in the top five places we have ever been in our own country. It is a sacred site it is filled with hundreds of mounds, graves, mounds uh, in the shapes of bears, wolves, snakes, and there's a 200-foot falcon with her wings spread, and you walk the boundary of that effigy mound, and you feel the flight of that being. So powerful. Then there's always the guest who's late, uh, complicated, and that for me would be Glacier National Park, a park that I dearly love, but it terrifies me because of the complexity of the story. Um, the betrayal of the Blackfoot people. Um, it's an international park on the border of Canada. And the very forms that it has been named after, glaciers, are receding to the point that in 15 years there may be no glaciers. And then the surprise guest which was Cesar Chavez National Monument, um, which I think points to an evolving sense of parks. Here's what I wanna share with you. President Obama's legacy, and I don't know how many of us realize this, now surpasses Teddy Roosevelt as a conservation president. He has protected over 265 million acres of public lands and seashore. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And one of my mentors, Wallace Stegner, whom I loved, when he talked about how America's national parks are our best idea, I would argue if he were here today, and he made his home in Vermont, as you know, this is where he's buried, I would say, Wally, I no longer think this is our best idea. I think it's an evolving idea. And here's what I mean by that. In 1916, Stephen T. Mather, the first director of the National Park Service, was a moneyed man, a privileged man. He made his fortunes from borax, 20 mules strong. He loved the national parks. He held millionaire parties, um, picnic tables in the Great Smokies, asking, can you help fund these parks? The federal government cannot carry this burden. And when he was thinking about Yosemite, what he was thinking was, would Mrs. Astor be comfortable camping there? She wasn't. <laughs> and so the Iwani Hotel was built, ironically named after the very people that the park displaced. Fast forward 100 years, the Iwani Hotel, which many of you may have been to, 
is no longer carrying that name because of a trademark dispute with corporations. So the fact that, that this was, these were the indigenous people has been lost. And now it's corporate. Think about this. We have a black president, 2012, who's a community, was a community organizer, who during that year, 2012, chose to honor another community organizer, Cesar Chavez, and established the Cesar Chavez National Monument in Keene, California, the United Farm Workers. Think about what other national monuments President Obama has brought into the register. Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument. Just um, two months ago, a week after the Orlando shootings, mass murders in uh, Florida, Stonewall National Monument to acknowledge the LGBT struggle and triumph. An evolving idea. And the idea that I am most excited about right now during the centennial is the Bears Ears National Monument proposal set forward by five tribes in Utah and the Colorado Plateau, the Four Corners area, the Navajo, Hopi, Zuni, the two Ute nations, with 25 other Puebloan tribes in the American Southwest saying, President Obama, will you please protect 1.9 million acres in Cedar Mesa, adjacent to Canyonlands, which is our home ground, the land of our ancestors, where their songs can still be heard carried by the wind, where our ceremonies take place, where our medicines are held. And what a beautiful offering of peace in our country's shadowed history of Native people, that on the centennial of this anniversary of the National Park Service, this could be extended to the tribes. I think it will happen. I think it will happen. A quick story. Utah, five national parks, 11 national monuments, our backyard. When I was eight years old, growing up Mormon, it was a ritual that before you were baptized, you would climb Mount Timpanogos and enter into Timpanogos Cave. And we were told that it was there, inside the mountain, that you could see the heart of the Ute Maiden. That was the story we were raised with. So you climb this very steep paved trail, um, a mile and a half. I remember these big iron green doors that are opened. There's a park ranger, and we immediately walk in to this cavern where stalactites and stalagmites register as teeth. You walk on this riser where it's very cool, the temperature drops. Um, you walk through such evocative places as Father Time's Jewel Box, the Valley of Sleep. But all I could think of is where is the maiden's heart? And toward the end, there is this shimmering, wet, dripping, red, yellow, gold heart. For me, it was beating. And I was completely obsessed with this heart. And I thought, if I were to reach out and touch it, would it register as hot or cold? So obsessed was I with the heart of this mountain that suddenly the lights went off, the door slammed, and I was left alone in a depth of darkness that was so profound that you could wave your hand and see nothing. I can't tell you when fear transformed into awe, but in those moments, I felt the heart of that mountain beating in sync with mine. The door opened, the lights went on, my primary teacher ran toward me and said, oh, thank heavens you're saved. And what I wanted to say was, the mountain saved me. And I think for the rest of my life, I've been searching for that one experience. The heart of something so deep, so old, so true, 
that that is what has propelled me. I think each of us has a mother park, and I want to share with you mine and read an excerpt from Grand Teton National Park. Are you dripping like I am? <laughs> On my father's 80th birthday, we saw a bear, a grizzly standing upright. We had just hiked to Grandview Point in Grand Teton National Park, where Emma Matilda Lake and Two Ocean Lake appear below. And if you turn around, the glory of the Teton Range looms behind you. We were a party of four generations, the youngest just one year old, and we were resting at the base of the trail when the grizzly appeared. Instead of being afraid, we stood, as the bear did, trying to get a better look at the elusive beast. The bear bolted into the woods, gone. My niece smiled and looked to her grandfather. Happy birthday, John. Like so many families, our family's been coming to the Tetons for generations. Grand Teton National Park was a cherished landscape for my great-grandfather, John Henry Tempest Sr. He passed his affection for this place on to my grandfather, John Henry Tempest Jr., who passed it on to his sons, John Henry Tempest III and Richard Blackett Tempest, who passed it on to us, and another two generations past mine. Our entire Tempest clan can be found here most summers, climbing peaks, hiking trails, and cherishing the wildflowers and wildlife, knowing each species by name. Our national parks are memory palaces where our personal histories reside. All you need to know is my father was known as Teton Tempest in college. <laughs> Not long ago, my father and I were hiking to Taggart Lake, a short, lovely walk to the base of the Tetons. As we walked up the trail, we heard a horn blowing repeatedly. Around the bend, a man in a Harvard sweatshirt, half crazed with fear, was holding a bear horn out in front of him, pressing the button every 15 seconds or so. A large canister of bear spray hung low from his belt and numerous bear bells dangled from his backpack. He looked like a one-man marching band. The expression on his face when he met us head on was one of sheer terror. Good God, man, my father said, you look like you belong in the circus, not in the Tetons. I've been hiking this trail for 70 years and never seen a bear yet. Cut the horn. I forget what the hiker said in response, but I do recall my father's parting comment. If I were you, I wouldn't advertise where you went to school. The Rockefellers, like in Acadia, had an enormous impact on establishing these parks. And as you know, um, John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, went on vacation to Yellowstone, where Horace Albright was the superintendent. He took Mr. Rockefeller to the Tetons, already a national park, but it was simply the range, rock and ice. And he took him to the far eastern side and without saying a word, Mr. Rockefeller saw that sea of sage and that winding, meandering river called the Snake with herds of bison, elk, grizzlies, wolves, and said, this needs to be protected. And surreptitiously, he bought up major ranches, parts of the land. You can imagine that did not go over well for the Westerners, for the cowboys. And in an act of protest, uh, there was a huge stampede saying, not on our land, not in our backyard. Um, no president would accept the gifts of the Rockefellers of this land until finally John D. said to FDR, you either take these lands or I'm going to sell them off. And they became a national monument, later absorbed into the Tetons. Cliff Hansen, who led that stampede, um, became Wyoming's governor, a distinguished senator, and on his deathbed of a man in his 80s said, I was on the wrong side of history. It was the best thing that ever happened to Wyoming. I think a vow was made between a father and son, and Lawrence Rockefeller, as his father was about to give and deed that land over to the federal government, he said, Father, couldn't we just save the best piece for us, the JY Ranch? And his father said no, and 
Lawrence pleaded. And finally, I think a vow was made. That family, the Rockefellers, kept that JY ranch for over 70 years. Every president uh, vacationed there, heads of state, families, relatives, friends. And then when Lawrence Rockefeller was 92 years old, he kept that vow. And he sent a letter to each of his kin, Federal Express, saying we've had the land long enough. It now belongs to the American people. It was not an easy decision, but it was a noble decision. And it's now rewilded those 30 cabins, the lodge, the horses, the trails, all rewilded, restored for us to see. The scales of nature will always seek equilibrium. A feather can tip the balance. The Lawrence S. Rockefeller Preserve was dedicated on June 21st, 2008. Mr. Rockefeller's daughter, Lucy Rockefeller Roletsky, said, quote, my father recognized mind, body, spirit as one word. My own father was among the first visitors in Grand Teton National Park to see the eastern shore of Phelps Lake when it was finally open to the public. As a man who has walked most of the trails in the Tetons, he walked the newly marked trail in awe, never imagining that this path would one day be open to him too. The Lawrence Rockefeller Preserve has become his favorite place in the Tetons. We have walked it together well over a dozen times, and each time we've gleaned something new. A patch of columbines, a doe in her fawns, an unexpected headstone among the pines. The path to Phelps Lake remains a place of personal meditation. This was Lawrence Far Rockefeller's intention. The Rockefellers shared their wealth. Our public lands, whether a national park or monument, wildlife refuge, forest, or prairie, make each one of us land rich. It is our inheritance as citizens of a country called America. In the summer of 2014, Lawrence's youngest brother, David, the last living child of John D. Rockefeller, Jr., returned to the restored shores of Phelps Lake. Gone were the horse stables, the cabins, the lodge, wild gardens of paintbrush extended down to the lake shore. Sitting in a wheelchair, one year shy of 100, David Rockefeller looked out across Phelps Lake toward Death Canyon with tears streaming down his cheeks. Not a year of my life has passed without the Tetons jagged presence, not one. The Tetons are my mother park. I am of this place. Family is a place and my family is located here. Those who are living and those who have passed. I am settled in the scent of sage. After we had been gifted by the sight of the grizzly on my father's birthday, John picked up his great-grandson, Wyatt, and held him. Did you see that big bear, little man? Later that day, Wyatt would take his first awkward steps toward the extended hands of his great-grandfather on his 80th birthday. He would not know it then, but one day he would be told that the day he learned to walk was the day he saw a grizzly standing upright in the presence of family. Four generations that will be followed by four more and four more beyond that. This is what we can promise the future, a legacy of care, that we will be good stewards and not take too much or give back too little that we will recognize wild nature for what it is in all its magnificent and complex history, an unfathomable wealth that should be consciously saved, not ruthlessly spent. Privilege is what we inherit by our status as homo sapiens living on this planet. This is the privilege of imagination. What we choose to do with our privilege as a species is up to each of us. Humility is born in wildness. We are not protecting grizzlies from extinction. They are protecting us from the extinction of experience. We tremble. The very presence of a grizzly returns us to an ecology of awe. We tremble at what appears to be a dream, yet stands before us on two legs, 
and roars. The last piece I want to read, and then we'll open it up for questions, and I so appreciate your, your patience, is really the bridge between, for me, the, the West and the East. And that bridge is Acadia. It was the first national park, as you know, in the East. It's one of the most visited parks in the system, in the country. And now it's bordering on four million visitors. It's a small island that looms large because of the vast expanse of ocean, the Atlantic. It's also the 100th anniversary of Acadia National Park. And I feel that New England is ground zero. Maine is ground zero. And I truly believe on the centennial of the National Park Service, the centennial of Acadia National Park, that Katahdin Woods and Water, this proposed national monument, will become a reality. I believe this will happen. And I think we can celebrate that. Say the word Maine and I swoon. It is everything my home in the American West is not. It is not wet. It is not green, nor does it exist on the edge of the continent. Say the word Acadia, and I see pink granite cliffs absorbing the shock of pounding waves, very different from the granite blocks I know that built the temple of my people in Salt Lake City. Say the word Scudic Point, and the taste of salt from the splash of tides reminds me of the inland sea that raised me in Utah's Great Basin. The edge of the sea is a strange and beautiful place, writes Rachel Carson. It is here, in the settled wild of Maine, that I find sanctuary from the painful politics surrounding western wilderness. I don't know enough to have my heart broken in the east. What I do know is that over the past three decades I've been coming to Acadia National Park, this landscape has entered my DNA. As the Colorado River shrinks from its historic banks due to drought, it is a comfort to sit on Acadia's otter cliffs, a place of shimmering waters in the midst of a seeming apocalypse. From a distance, the mountains in Acadia appear blue and rounded, not at all like the toothed peaks of the west with hanging canyons and glaciers. You can climb them in an afternoon wearing a skirt, but they are no less wild. Their grandeur belongs not to ruggedness, but to a gradual ascent toward grace. Once you're on top of the bald summit, a view of a watery planet inspires. On my first trip to Maine, I couldn't account for how familiar it felt. This place, this place where I had never been registered in my blood like heat. It didn't make sense. I didn't want to leave. I had to return. Our national parks hold our stories. And what I've learned is it's not just one story. It's not just a dominant story of white people, privileged people, but it's a story of all people for all time. What I learned in Acadia, I couldn't understand what that feeling was that I had in my bones. It made no sense. I went, I was teaching a class on memoir. I was in Utah. I thought, just because I don't like genealogy, because I was forced down my throat, and we had to go back four, six generations. My mother is Diane Dixon Tempest. Her mother is Letty Romney Dixon. Her mother is Valate Lee Romney. Her mother is Cynthia Celestial Bunker. Her mother is Emily Abbott Bunker. I knew that in my bones. We went, I thought, the students can find their genealogy, come back with a story. We went during Black History Month. We heard this dynamic woman, uh, Reverend Mateen, African-American and American Indian descent. Here's what she said. You think you're coming to hear me. Wrong. You've been tapped by one of your ancestors. And you better find out which one, because they have something for you. That was it. So I said to my students, OK, come back in four hours with a story. Think about who's calling you. So I went with them. I sat down at the computers. I closed my eyes. The name that came into my heart was Cynthia Celestial Bunker. I only had seen one small picture. That was it. It was my great grandmother's, whom I knew, her mother. No one knew anything about her. I put her name in. What I can tell you is she was racially ambiguous. 
I put her name in, voila, an entire family tree. Every one of my ancestors on my matrilineal line were from Maine. Not only Maine, but Hancock County. Not only Hancock County, but Mount Desert Island, specifically Cranberry Island. What I found out through genealogy was that Cynthia Celestial Bunker, the daughter of Emily Abbott Bunker from Maine, that came out across the plains, joined the Mormon church, her husband took a plural wife, left for Scotland with her four children. She said the great bane of her existence was poverty and polygamy. She fell in love with a freed slave. There were 49 in Ogden, Utah, putting in the railroad. Her husband came home, saw that she was pregnant, outraged, took a Scottish young girl as his fifth wife, 14 years old. They went down to Dixie, St. George, Utah. In his journal, I found that had been hidden from our family. Emily gave birth to her daughter today in Tokerville, Utah. Toker means black in Shoshone language. These are the stories that are held in the land. And the last thing I will tell you is I went to visit my ancestors, took that boat, Bunker and Beal, over to Cranberry Island, said to the driver, who happened, to, I think, to be my cousin, Justin Bunker, I said, hi, I'm Terry from Salt Lake City. I think we're related. And he gunned the boat. <laughs> By the time we got to Cranberry Island, four people, including the island historian, said, huh, we understand you're a Bunker. Would you like to meet David? We walked. I was nervous. Finally, the historian said, I think you need an introduction. We go to David's home, the father of Justin. He knocks on the door. David answers with his arms folded, white beard, white forehead from his cap, um, clearly a boatman. Um, and he said, David, this is Terry. She's from Salt Lake City, and she thinks you're relatives. He opened the door, again, pushed it with his elbow. And I said, hi, I'm Terry. I think we're related. Um, through Edward Bunker, he goes, Edward Bunker didn't live here. David did. Long pause. And then it was a little uncomfortable. And the historian said, so how was the winter? And he said, rough. And I said, was it the worst you've ever seen? No. <laughs> I put out my hand and I said, thank you very much. It's great to meet you. He extended his hand, and I saw on his T-shirt that he had been hiding. My parents said I could be anything I wanted to be, so I chose to be an asshole. <laughs> and I burst out laughing, as did he, and I said, we're definitely related. <laughs> I want to close with, with this idea, and then a few questions, and then I want to end with the story. Oren Lyon, faith keeper of the Turtle Clan of the Seneca Nation, recently said, it can no longer be about the color of our skin. It must be about the color of our blood. Our national parks are blood. All over the world, this is true. They are more than scenery. They are portals and thresholds of wonder an open door that swings back and forth from the past to the present. This something we call America lives not so much in political institutions as in the rocks and skies and seas, wrote the photographer Paul Strand. Whenever I visit a, a national park, in its shadowed history and its light, I meet the miraculous. Questions? Comments? Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And it's absolutely true, and you've been such a powerful advocate, and I thank you for your work. Um, it is in the book. Um, it's the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I have this fantasy of a triple crown. What was that? Oh, how wonderful. Oh, there it is. Should we let it go, or do you think? So beautiful. Yeah, it is Brooks Totem. Um, I have this fantasy of a triple crown with Maine on one side of the crown, Bears Ears on the other, and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the centerpiece. We're certainly hoping. I think it's deeply political because of all the oil and gas in the international waters. But certainly advocates have been um, preparing for this for half a century or more. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes, Ivy. This is really terrifying. I do not want to have an argue with Ivy over metaphor. You win. Thank you. I think that's true. Right. And I really appreciate what you said. And I, I think, you know, you hope as a writer that you grow more courageous, that you take more risks. Because to me, the only book worth writing is the book that threatens to kill you. And each of the books I've written, from Refuge on, has done that. And, and I, if you had asked me, was Great Salt Lake a metaphor? Absolutely not. It was a physical, liquid being. Was my mother dying? Yes. Did she pass? She did indeed. And when I saw the, the outline of Antelope Island, it was her body shimmering above the lake. I think what I meant, and I'm still discovering what this book is, I thought I was writing a book about the national parks. I thought I was writing a book about public lands. And I truly thought it would be an easy, ex you know, exciting, simple book, because it's what I've given my life to. This book has been the most difficult, and it asked the most of me. More than Rwanda, more than Hieronymus Bosch, um, more than the Spanish Inquisition, and here's why. I absolutely saw my limitations. I am not a historian. I am not a scientist. I do not work for the, the National Park Service. So I think every writer has to ask themselves, by what authority do I write? And in this instance, I realized I write out of the authority of my heart. I'm a storyteller. So I think that's where I began. I thought I was writing a book about national parks. What I realized is I was writing a book about America. And when my editor said, Terry, this is not a feel-good book, I think they were expecting Here's the trails you go on, here's a guidebook, you know, raw, raw, black, red, white, and blue, not at all. I felt that if we were really to look at the history of these lands and their significance, we had to dare to look beneath the leaves to our own shredded history. And, and what it did is it transformed me, Ivy. Um, I fell back in love with our country. I did not know Gettysburg. In my ignorance as a Westerner, I thought that it was your war. I thought it was the Union. I thought it was the Southern War, the Confederates. What I didn't realize in my ignorance was that this war was fought for the West to see if slavery would be carried forward. What I didn't know is that you could go to Gettysburg less than 10 years ago and never hear the word slavery uttered. It was about 
mechanics. It was about ammunition. It was about strategies and generals. And then the historian of the National Park Service said, this is wrong. And black historians said, where are we? And the most chilling thing was when I kept going back season after season after season after season to make sense of a war that made no sense at all. Here were some reenactors at Pickett's charge, dressed as Confederates, ready to shoot the cannons. And I asked them in all sincerity, what were the causes of the Civil War? And this gentleman looked at me and he said, if you think I'm going to say it's slavery, forget it. It's about states' rights. It's about the federal government getting in the way. Slaves, guns, different items, same issue. That is chilling. And I realized the war has never ended. That the rhetoric I was hearing on the battlefield of Gettysburg is the rhetoric I'm hearing around our own family's dinner table. That's what this book did for me. Thank you. One more question. Yes. How does, in this nation divided, um, help us to understand an ethic of place? Yes. Not, just a sense of place. Not just a sense of place, but becomes an ethic of place. It's a great question. And I think, on top of that question, I would say, how, at this time of division, which we're seeing every day politically, how does our United States of America, which is anything but united, become a United States of humility? And I think with that question, I would love to end with this story. And I think that it will shed light. Last year, Brooke and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. And that in itself is miraculous. And we both turned to each other and said, how do we want to celebrate this? And instantaneously, both of us said Yellowstone. And after Yellowstone, we said wolves, the Lamar Valley, up in the northern part of the park, adjacent to Montana, the border. So we went. We got up before dawn in that beautiful holy time of crepuscular hours. And we stood there in the Lamar Valley, and as the first glint of light shone, we saw the, the mist just lifting above the Lamar River. And there we saw a mound. We took out our binoculars, and it was clear that it was a bison skeleton. Um, as more light came, we noticed two coyotes cleaning bones on that scaffolding of ribs. We saw three bald eagles light, and then a circle of, um, of light again, and we saw ravens, all scavengers cleaning bones. About that time, dawn, a ranger came up to us and told us the backstory that yesterday, the previous day, um, this mother bison was in the process of giving birth to a stillborn. The calf was born breech. It was dead. She was struggling. And the Lamar Valley pack of wolves took her down quickly, violently. Predator prey. We focused back on the scaffolding of bones. We saw the hackles rise on the coyotes. They fled. The eagles flew. The ravens vanished. And out from the lodgepole pine forest emerged this magnificent silver white wolf and entered that cavern of bones. From where we were, we could see his flanks. We watched that belly swell for over an hour. And then the wolf came out of that cavern, a bib of blood, and disappeared as quickly as it disappeared, as quickly as it had appeared. We left went on with our day. We came back at twilight, hoping that we'd still see that wolf. 
the bones were shimmering, licked clean. We noticed that to the side, maybe a quarter of a mile away, there were 200, 300 bison grazing. All at once, a line of seven bison, evenly spaced, single file, walked to the mother bison and circled her body, circled it twice, nudged her, sniffed her, pawed the ground, and lowered their heads. Circled one more time, and then returned to the herd, single file, evenly spaced, save one lone bull who stayed with her. We are not the only species that lives and breathes and loves on this planet. That to me is an ethic of place. We are one species among many. This is the hour of land. And I would urge each of us, with the gifts that are ours, to give up those gifts in the name of community, in the name of these public lands, the closest thing we have to sacred lands, and protect them. Thank you.